Shalakaya Chaksu Ummilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachari Nirvisesa Sungyavari Vastyatya Deve Satarine Chakalpa Tarigascha Kripa Sindhu Ve Bachapatitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhuna Tiranda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we are continuing and for the next three days today, Tuesday and Wednesday, we will um, explore this particular verse here from verse number three of the Shikshastika prayers. As we have been uh, mentioning that uh, there are nine stages of bhakti, a Tao strata, faith, Sadhu Sangha, association with devotees, Bhajana Kriya, taking to the process of Krishna consciousness, Anartha Nivritti, um, getting free from those obstacles, uh, unwanted desires in the heart. Uh, four, Nishta, which means steadiness. Five, Ruchi, a sweet taste for Bhakti, develops. Ashakti, Ashakti means attachment to Krishna, strong attachment, fixed attachment. Uh, bhava means genuine, heartfelt feelings of affection directed towards Krishna. And Prema means uh, love for God. <laughs> so these eight or nine stages covered by these eight verses. And as we mentioned, the first verse is Adao Strata, faith, because it gives, by listing the, the seven glories of the holy name, it gives faith in the process of chanting. The Sadhu Sangha, it also brings one into the association of devotees in order to chant and to serve. And Bhajana Kriya, it prepares one to take shelter of the process of devotional service. Anartha Nivrisi is verse number two, and that means despite all the benefits mentioned and offered in the beginning by the first verse, uh, there are blockages, and these are the anarthas or unwanted desires, and specifically Chaitanya Mahaprabhu puts emphasis on offenses, we have to see what we need to do to overcome offenses, to avoid committing offenses and to eradicating the results of offenses through proper activity and conduct. Um, this next verse is Nishta. This is steadiness. So the Acharyas explain that this verse helps one to stay fixed on the process of Krishna consciousness. And you'll see that this particular verse focuses solely on the practitioner, us. <laughs> and it mentions four characteristics that one must cultivate and eventually develop in order to chant the holy names of the Lord. So we'll read the verse, Trinadapi, Sunichena, Tayor Iva, Suhishnuna, Amaninam Amanadena, Kirtaniya Sada Hari. One who thinks himself lower than the grass, who is more tolerant than a tree, who does not expect personal honor, but is always prepared to give all respects to others, can very easily always chant the holy name of the Lord. So here in this verse, 
four characteristics are mentioned and three of them are what comes from us outwardly and the other one is something that we should be prepared not to accept <laughs> okay so the one first one is humility second one is tolerance the third one is not wanting to be honored by others and the fourth one is to give all respects to others that means all others everyone and the verse says by cultivating these qualities one can very easily chant always Hare Krishna <laughs> so you see the um, ingredients needed in order to really uh, stay fixed in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Now these are qualities. Now these qualities are not foreign to the soul, but may be something that the conditioned soul is unaware of in terms of how one uh, is performing activities. So we'll go through, today we'll go through humility, tomorrow we'll go through tolerance, and the last day we'll go through the last two. Doesn't expect honor and personal honor for others. Okay, so Mahaprabhu says this is the essence of his instructions. So that's a very, uh, what we say, direct and very powerful statement. This is the essence of everything he teaches. Hmm. And so what we see here is something that is very uh, much desired in order to practice Krishna consciousness. In fact, these things are uh, fundamental to the to the to the advancement of the devotee. And as we mentioned, by cultivating these things, one can stay fixed, nishta, steady in Krishna consciousness. When we look at them, and then we see the comparison being made between the qualities and a particular feature of nature, like the first is humility, lower than the grass. So the grass is considered to be low in the sense that people walk on it. You know, animals eat on it. Animals uh, perform their natural bodily uh, activities on it. The grass has to tolerate, has to somehow or other is in a situation <laughs> where, you know, we don't give much importance to grass. <laughs> Quite low. So Lord Chaitanya doesn't mince words when he speaks. He said, one should think themselves lower than the grass. And it's interesting because in the uh, in some of the translations, the word grass is not used, especially in India, because there's not much grass in India. <laughs> At least has never been. The only grass is there that is for grazing ground for the animals. But the word is used is straw, S-T-R-A-W. So the difference between grass and straw is slight, but there is a difference. When you step on the grass, and the grass has a tendency to again re-get up. It gets up again by its own uh, natural existence. It kind of springs back, you might say. Grass is like that. But um, straw doesn't. <laughs> Straw lays flat and stays in the same position. So in other translations, you see the words lower than the straw in the street. <laughs> and this, so this is a very, when we say, can be very, feel like we think, oh my God, how do I ever get to that level of, you know, quality? Uh, there is two types of humility. Mm -hmm. There is humility that is 
that is favorable for bhakti and there's humility that comes close to direct bhakti itself. Um, one is born of constant chanting and the other one is favorable for bhakti. Mm -hmm. This verse contains both types of nishta or both types of humility. Humility is so much a desirable quality that uh, Sri Krishna considers it bhakti itself. So this is interesting. Bhakti itself can be compared to one who is humble. One who is actually humble and executing activities in that humble mood. The humble mood itself is, is accepted as the service. That is the unique and what we say formidable quality of humility. And one of the reasons why humility is so important is because the, the conditioned soul in the material world thinks himself important. <laughs> he thinks himself good. He likes to glorify his own good qualities, either to himself or to others. Even if he is now outwardly proud, he's inwardly proud. It says that even a pauper becomes proud of his, the fact that he has a few pennies or a few pence. So the conditioned soul in the material world is puffed up. And that's generally the case with, with all conditioned souls. And that kind of like, that is the mood of material activities. And people vie for, vie for positions in the material world by trying to somehow or other present themselves as being more qualified, more intelligent, more adept than others in order to get what they want. So there's this kind of, uh, when we say anti-humble mood that goes on in material life. And so therefore, in order to practice Krishna consciousness, one has to develop the reverse, and that is this utter humility. And in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, in the uh, 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, I'm sorry, yeah, no, 13th chapter, 13th chapter, Krishna mentions the 20 items of knowledge. Amanitam, Adambitam, Ahimsam Arjivam. And he goes on to mention all 20. And he says these are items of knowledge. And the first one, Amanitam, is humility. So he puts humility foremost in the 20 qualities that are required or that are features of transcendental knowledge. In that same uh, purport, describing humility, it says humility means not wanting the feature to be honored by others. Mm -hmm. People will honor you, and that's nice, but it's not that you look for it or you even want it. <laughs> Devotee doesn't want to be honored. They think, what is the use of honoring me? I want to honor the Supreme Lord. I want to honor those persons who are serving the Supreme Lord with pure devotion. So devotee really feels, well, sometimes, uh, what's the word? Uh, out of place. Uh, confused or even averse to receiving humble humility uh, uh, receiving praise the body doesn't like to get praised but praise will come praise will come so what do you do because when praise come if you accept it your false ego only increases 
Therefore, a humble devotee will simply see that the praise given to me is meant for those who have made me for what I am, and that is my spiritual master, the association of devotees, the mercy of Sri Krishna. So we, we say we pass it on. We don't keep it. We say all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to the pure devotees of the Lord. All glories to the Lord himself. And the devotees not only says that, but they mean it. Because the soul is one ten thousand the size of the tip of a hair. This is mentioned in the sweet in the Swata Swatara Upanishads, where it describes the size of the soul. The soul cannot be seen because it's so small. It actually has measurements. Of course, there is no electronic device that can measure the soul, but through Shastric evidence, we hear the size of the soul. So if you take a hair and you take the tip of the hair and you cut it into 100 pieces, if you could do that, you can do that. And then if you took one of those 100 pieces and cut that piece into another 100 pieces, that would be the size of the soul, one ten thousand the size of the tip of a hair. So the tough soul is small. <laughs> of course, it's that's when it's inside the material body. This is the size of the soul inside the material body. That's why it's people can't detect it. it can only be understood by its by the characteristics of its activities. And therefore it becomes very difficult to understand actually the presence of the soul within the body, but we understand by symptoms. Okay, um, give me one minute and I'll be back. I just have to do one quick thing. Thank you. So when we understand our size, at least on the spiritual level, we won't, because whatever body we have and whatever uh, characteristics that we have related to the body are all ephemeral and all what we say has nothing to do with us. It's been, it's just something we have in the material world. That's all. We put a lot of emphasis on it because it appears to be something important, but it actually it's not. It's the soul that's important. The body is important because it houses the soul. That's why we take care of the body very nicely because the presence of the soul exists within. If we don't take care of the body, the soul will also be affected by our lack of care. And so one has to give the body whatever it needs in order to maintain itself nicely but still it's compared to a car when you when you buy a new car and you're very proud you got your nice new car so when you look in the mirror you think oh wow that's me you know and you get sometimes you get excited about what you see and sometimes you don't but in any case it's like having different kinds of cars if you have a ferrari a sports car you think wow but if you have like a broken down Audi or something, you think, oh. So it's these bodies are like cars. That's all they are. They're machines. Very nice machine, very difficult machine to, to understand how it works. It's created by the material energy under the direction of the Lord himself. It's a very amazing machine, but it's not us. So, but the soul is what is important. And therefore, as we cultivate these qualities, the soul's characteristics starts to formulate on the surface of our mind, on the surface of our heart. And we can also actually experience this through the practical application of that. So how to become humble? So sometimes devotees think, well, how do I, how do I become humble? 
Well, one, one of the ways we can be, become humble is that we don't put important, too much importance on ourselves. We put importance on Krishna, importance on our practice of devotional service. A devotee doesn't like to talk about themselves or talk, they may talk about themselves in a way to instruct others, but otherwise they don't find much, uh, uh, when we say interest in talking about themselves, they like to talk about Krishna, they like to talk about pure devotional service, they like, they like to talk about the philosophy. They like to about talk, talk about how to make their service nicer for Krishna. So there's uh, different ways that one can practice this mood of humility. And you'll see that these qualities that we are describing are interrelated to each other. It's not like each one is a distinct quality, although it's mentioned separately for the sake of understanding still each one of these is interrelated to the other and we'll speak about humility in relationship to tolerance uh, at a, tomorrow when we deal with the principle of tolerance there is a humility that comes by way of understanding one's position as we just mentioned one's finite nature i'm small <laughs> Krishna is big. In fact, the word jiva, jiva actually translate into the word tiny. So the word jiva really means tiny. That's one of the translations of the word. So Krishna is infinitesimal, unlimited. We are finite and we are limited. We are so limited that although we are spiritual, we are overcome by a lesser energy called the material energy. The material energy is less powerful than the spiritual energy. But when the spiritual energy takes shelter of the material energy, the material energy controls it. And therefore, we become controlled by the energy that we try to enjoy. So this is important to understand. The more we try to enjoy something in this world, the more we become controlled by that same object give you an example. This is a good example. People like to smoke cigarettes. So they're thinking they're enjoying that, that pleasure of inhaling smoke. But actually, they're becoming controlled in an addictive way by the by this, uh, this feature of trying to enjoy so much so that they even they cannot even give it up. And it becomes an addiction. So something that they try to enjoy becomes something that becomes their captivation. Mm -hmm. Something that ultimately comes, comes along with being destructive at the same time. But that's true with anything in this world. That's why people who are spiritualists, even those outside of bhakti, who understand the nature of the material energy, do not like to get involved with anything material because they know as soon as you do, you become controlled by that. Okay, so there's another humility arising from the mind when it comes in contrast to Krishna's mercies with one's resistance to it. When we sometimes have it become, when we actually come in contact with Krishna's mercy, and we realize the quality of that mercy, we understand our, a little bit about our position of humility, that we are dependent on his mercy. Otherwise, and this is uh, also very, very much a part of our existence, um, just like, we can't live unless we have air, but air is not manufactured by us. It comes from the outside. So we're giving air. We have nice lungs, but still the air is required in order to live, to breathe. Uh, we have a body who needs, who needs food and the food is not manufactured by us. It's coming from the outside, from another source, the material nature. 
So we see, if you go through the list, that we are dependent in so many ways upon so many external persons and features of the material energy just to live from day to day. So this helps us to become humble and at the same time appreciate the fact that God's mercy is coming in the form of these things. Therefore, devotee is grateful. Gratefulness is also one of the qualities of, the, of humility because one who is grateful understands that I'm given so much and therefore uh, because I'm given so much, I can do so much, I can be so much, therefore I'm grateful for these gifts that are coming with that. Um, there's another type of humility where when we engage in sense gratification and we get a little bit unhappy about our engagement in sense gratification, we start to re become remorseful, we start becoming re regrettable. Uh, we start to think, oh, boy, I'm so attached to sense gratification. What am I going to do? So there's a type of humility that comes from this remorseful feeling due to our attachment to sense gratification. Uh, there's another type of humility, which is really one of the more glorious forms of humility, and is that one who has something to be proud of, but is not proud. One who has good qualities, abilities, resources, good birth, the list goes on, good intelligent, and still they were, they're humble. Mahaprabhu, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he glorified Rupa and Sanatana Goswami because they were born in the Saraswat, the Saraswat Brahman family. They were both learned in Shastra and in material activities. They were expert managers of government. They had what we say the respect of the Brahminical Brahmin community. And they were, but you still, and respect from many other persons also, still, they were not proud. They remained in the mood of being humble. In fact, it says that uh, when you look for humility in its highest regard in terms of a particular individual, Sanatan Goswami is that person. He is considered humility personified. And this particular uh, definition is born out of one particular incident wherein uh, Chanatan Goswami came to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And so when he came there and he offered his respects, Lord Chaitanya noticed that the bottom of his feet were all burnt. They were red and they were blisters were coming. And Mahaprabhu was a little unhappy to see that. And so he said something. He said, how did you get here? Which way did you come? He said, well, I came, I came by way of the beach. Now this was in the month of Jaist. Jaist is July, where the sands are burning hot during that time. And so he walked across these hot burning sands to go to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Mahaprabhu said, why didn't you take the normal route past the Jagannath temple? Why did you come this way? And uh, Sanatan Goswami said, well, my dear Lord. And he said it in a very humble way. He said, you know, I'm so low. I'm so what we say. Uh, he, 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 he criticized himself in so many ways. He said, if the pujaris in the Jagannath temple who are always coming in and out of the temple to serve Lord Jagannath, if they see me or if they even pass by me, then this is not good. So in order to avoid that, I took the path by way of the beach. 
And Mahaprabhu was happy to hear that because it was all due to his natural humility. Of course, the uh, Acharyas give us a little caution not to try to imitate these levels of humility by the great souls. The basic humility is understood by a devotee who is grateful for the opportunity to serve, is grateful for everything that is given to them, is grateful for the association of devotees, is happy with whatever comes by way of the natural arrangements of Krishna. So these are some of the characteristics of humility. Uh, one devotee in ISKCON came up with another definition of humility, which I think is quite interesting. It has meaning. And it goes like this. He said, humility means not to think of oneself less, but, th but to think less not to think less of oneself, but to think of oneself less. Not to think less of oneself, but to think less of, to think of oneself less. In other words, a proud person is always thinking about himself, but a humble person is always thinking how to serve Krishna, how to, how to develop the qualities in service of the Lord and his devotees. Mm -hmm. A proud person is very much infatuated by their own existence and always, always trying to buttress that existence with more and more ways for material success. <laughs> okay, so this is one of the quali qualifications that Lord Chaitanya gives in order to actually approach the holy name in a spontaneous way one can easily very easily, he doesn't say easily, he says very easily, always. Three words, these are like three adjectives in a row, verily, very easily, always chant the holy names of the Lord. So you see, here is one of the, fun, the, the most important qualities in the Vaishnava. Okay, I'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions regarding humility. Thank or so anything related to the verse in general. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for a wonderful class on humility. It's really always important to learn what it is, basically, first of all, and then apply it on our personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, on ourselves, basically, how we deal with it, how do, how do we do it, how do we become humble. Uh, so, devotees, if you have any comments, reflections, any questions, please go ahead and ask uh, or type it in the chat box. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All grace to Srila Prabhupada, all grace to Your Holiness. Uh, Guru Maharaj, you were mentioning about uh, being grateful uh, towards others. Uh, like, uh, we can be grateful um, to Krishna easily, but, uh, uh, but uh, sometimes we can't be grateful to all other people around us. Guru Maharaj. Well, Krishna works through your association. When we get things from Krishna, it comes by the way of others, generally. If Krishna says, give this person a donation, then that person will give a donation. Krishna says, you know, show some respect to this person, that person will do it. In other words, Krishna is in the heart of all living entities. He's also dictating how one should act and how one should react. So, yeah, we can give respects to Krishna, but we have to understand we also see Krishna coming through in the material energy and through other living beings. We all will give credit to other living beings, but we should know behind the scene it's Krishna's sanction that makes everything happen. He says that, you know, I am the, the, 
doer in all activities. All activities culminate with his sanction, either directly for the devotees through the spiritual energy, the Daiva Prakriti, or indirectly through the non-devotees, through the par the uh, Paravakriti or the material energy. So giving credit and seeing a distinction between others and Krishna is only a partial understanding of the of how everything works. As Prabhupada said, no one can do anything without Krishna, nothing. He said, you can't even move your finger <laughs> unless Krishna sanctions that demigod to say, allow this person's finger to move. Yeah, because there's a demigod in charge of every feature of our existence, bodily existence, material existence. The soul is independent of that. So, yeah. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, um, but, um, yeah, I understand philosophically, but uh, sometimes I forget to apply it. Um, I forget to apply it um, in our day-to-day -day life, uh, Guru Maharaj. Um, so, application is more difficult, uh, Guru Maharaj. Well, yeah. That's... <laughs> Prabhupada would say just because it's difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. <laughs> yes. uh, how does something how does something difficult become easy? Let me ask you that question. The practice, maybe, Guru Maharaj. That's the word. Practice. Practice something and learn how to do it and practice how to do it in the right way and after a while it becomes part of you it becomes natural more natural that's why devotees like sometimes being put into difficult situations because it brings out their good qualities it forces them to take shelter of tolerance humility and krishna himself Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Today, um, you mentioned a lot of uh, important points about humility and uh, how to apply them. Uh, thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Mm -hmm. There's much more to it. I just touched the surface. This is a very lengthy subject, and we can speak on it from other angles of vision also, but our time is limited. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Pranam. Um, I had a, a couple of questions, if that's okay. The first one is, I think, a quick one. Um, I always noticed it's just semantics, but um, sometimes we see Taror Iva Sahishnuna and sometimes we see Taror Api Sahishnuna. Do you know why they're different? Uh, it's, um, the actual verse is the one that's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, so that's the one we read. So uh, Api and Eva mean the same thing, it means although. The word practically means the same. It's just used in different contexts. So the actual word in the verse is Eva, but sometimes you hear devotees and even Srila Prabhupada would say api. Chanad api, sunichena dayor api, suhishnana means the same thing. Chanad api, sunichena dayor iva, suhishnana. Thank you, Grimmage. Um, and then... It's, yeah, it's semantics. It's just, it's just a variation of the, the word meaning. That's all. Thank you. 
Um, and then the other question I had was around humility. Often I find um, with, you know, pe people around me and also myself, you know, it's people often ask like, what is the line between humility and um, self-esteem? So when is it okay, for example, to not tolerate um, if you feel like somebody's maybe not treating you properly? Like, how do we know where to draw that line? When we need to be more humble and when we should speak up? <laughs> that requires some intelligence. It requires experience also, both intelligence and experience. Usually experience dictates some messages that we can learn from. And then when these situations re-arise, we see, well, here's something similar that I've been in before. How do I, you know, we can see how to act or not act. Um, you'll see that Srila Prabhupada was like a lion in many cases. But he was a lion in certain ways, and then he was a lamb in another way. So that lamb-like nature, or that sweet nature, that humble nature, it doesn't relegate one to uh, what we say inaction or even um, lack of intelligence. You just you just have to know based on the situation, when to act and what to act and like that. But I think one of the things that address, addresses it, that if you happen to address a situation that is contrary to your feelings, or is contrary, it's obvious that it's contrary, then how you address that will make the big difference on how it's accepted or not accepted. And therefore, the mood of respect for all living entities is there. That's the main thing. If we lose respect for others, and that can happen, respect can be lost by familiarity. Respect can be lost by just because of differences of, of ways of thinking. But that's what Bhakti Vinoda Kaur explains that one should keep this mood of respect for all living entities and then one can traverse through the different challenges of life without being defeated. If you make a mistake, a lot of times because of our false ego, we try to hide the mistake behind some nice words. But sometimes the devotee, when he makes a mistake, he says, oh, I'm sorry, I actually made a mistake. Some people think, well, I'm, I'm so, you know, even devotees might even think that I don't make mistakes. And if I do, well, you know, I have the, um, it doesn't, it looks like a mistake to you, but to me, it's not a mistake. So... <laughs> A devotee is not like that. When it becomes obvious that they made a mistake, they apologize or they actually rectify themselves. That's another feature of humility. So in dealing with contrary situations, you have to really use your experiences that have come by way of success in the past. And at the same time, apply the intelligence according to the present situation. Speaking truthfully, but pleasingly, makes, the, makes your statement more and more, uh, what we say, what's the word? Not only acceptable, but more and more fluid. It moves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get stuck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, there's no formula except the practice. Each situation may warrant a slightly different approach. That's what it means to become Krishna conscious. When you're Krishna conscious, you know what to do.
Until you become Krishna conscious, we're practicing, you know, to get to that stage. <laughs> Did you get my letter? Um, did you send something today, Gurmarish? Yeah, last night. Oh, not yet, and I will check it right now. Okay, it's a little different kind of question, but anyway. Okay. We may not, you know, just take a look at it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Gurmarish. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you Maharaj. Uh, yeah. Maharaj, my question is a little extension of Radha Bhakti Mataji question. Uh, so, yes, like when we are dealing with devotee, including our family, it's easy to really develop this nature of humility. But when it comes to like... Uh, office life, then it's it <laughs> difficult to really... <laughs> yeah, when I was in Chicago, one man, he was practically crying. Yeah. You know, he was from India. He had been living in America, working in an office. He said, Maharaj, how do... You know, they, if they see you becoming humble in the office, they think you're weak. They think you're incompetent. You have to be aggressive. You have to be on top of things. <laughs> right? Absolutely, Maharaj. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did I answer that question? I think I've got that question about so many times. <laughs> it's like, what do you do? You know, you're in an environment that doesn't allow for humility to develop. But you have to be humble on your, in your persona, your own self, but you may be outwardly acting according to what's needed to get the job done. So humility is more than an outward expression, although outward expression is part of humility. The main part is your consciousness. Around devotees, where the word meek and humble becomes something more easily applicable, applicable and easily, you know, understandable. Amongst the non-devotees, it looks like some some form of weakness. But actually, even many materialistic people appreciate humility also, although they may not be humble themselves. But they they actually appreciate people who are humble. But that doesn't relegate you to be inactive or unintelligent. You still have to use your creative intelligence. You have to act according to your responsibility. But at the same time, you're always respectful to others. I mean, when you're in the office, you know, people one particular company wants to destroy another company. The, the, the language that goes on amongst the, the, the employees is usually criticism of somebody else. <laughs> it's just the way it is, right? People criticize others in order to make themselves feel good about themselves. Yeah, ultimately, the solution is not to get out of that environment. That's the ultimate solution. But I'm not going to give you that as an as an instruction. I'm just saying that that if you want to, you know, be free from that that mood, you have to somehow or other live in such a way that you associate only with devotees, even in the even in your occupational life. Well, therefore, Srila Prabhupada's whole plan was to create a, a society of devotees that was being somewhat insular and not dependent or even interacting with the materialists in a very, what we say, 
uh, needy way because we take a job because we need something. We want, to, we want them to give us some, some activity so we can get some money, so we can have some, we can have some live, we can live in this world. But that's, that's a stage we have to get beyond and then ultimately come to the stage of becoming free from that. Where we can uh, make a living without having to depend on the non-devotees for our livelihood. We are dependent on Krishna ultimately. How to do that? That is the Vanarshram system as Srila Prabhupada has given to us. It requires some thought, some work, some organization, some intelligence. As Srila Prabhupada said, um, this movement goes on by organization and intelligence. He used those two words together. How to intelligently organize not only the activities in devotional service, but how to orga intelligently organize our life that the way we're very, we can be very much in the mood, in the right mood of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, or in our present situation, we have to somehow adjust, you know, our values in such a way that they don't get destroyed, but at the same time, they don't get compromised. And at the same time, we can fulfill our obligations. In some occupations, it's maybe harder than in other occupations. It just depends on your occupation also. And it depends on your association too. Is that okay? Yes, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. I think uh, you rightly answered in terms of, like for me, uh, yeah, it's like sometimes difficult question, uh, especially when you are managing a team. Then yes, like as you rightly said that our value should be like internally we should be humble, but externally we have to take actions which are right uh, and, and have to apply some intelligence here. Yeah, once you get tired of that, then you'll... <laughs> <laughs> look for you know uh, a way of life that is free from that type of lifestyle <laughs> yeah one day <laughs> thank you Guru Maharaj thank you Hare Krishna uh, well. <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj please accept my humble obeisances our glories to Srila Prabhupada and our glories to you uh, Thank you very much for this for this amazing class because uh, this is such a topic which I, I really feel that uh, this has uh, really such depths that uh, we can go deeper and deeper all the time. And um, somehow, uh, because we can um, examine this topic from so many different angles, and I like to make a connection uh, between them. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about that sometimes when we speak about this verse, we speak about uh, this level of uh, being fixed. Uh, this also speaks about uh, humility. And uh, I also heard that uh, it's connected to bodily identification, that on this level, we have to get rid of this. And can you uh, speak a little about, about uh, these, these connections between these different uh, type of approaches? Bodily connection? Uh, it, yes. I, I think I read it in, in Burijan Prabhu's uh, uh, Japa book. So what, what is the essential point of your question? I, I, th I think I got a little bit lost in your explanation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, how these uh, different approaches that uh, uh, being fixed and uh, being humble and uh, getting rid of uh, bodily identification, these, uh, how do these connect? Being fixed, being humble, and getting rid of bodily identification. Yeah, it comes by the process of Krishna consciousness, it comes by chanting the holy names of the Lord. It comes by acting on the spiritual platform, not acting on the material platform. Material pl uh, platform means the desire to gain something through your activity. Spiritual platform means to act in such a way as that 
you offer whatever you do as an offering to the Lord and to his devotees. So, um, yeah, all this becomes amalgamated or what we say synchronized through the process of bhakti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bhakti means getting off the bodily platform. It, bhakti, getting off the bhakti bodily platform contains knowledge of my who I am, what is my position in relationship. That is called sambandha. And then it also we call is vairagya, renunciation by accepting the principles of giving up certain desired activities for a higher purpose. And that's called renunciation. And then Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita the different types of renunciations according to the different features of our, our existence. Renunciation, uh, you know, external renunciation, internal renunciation, different types of renunciations. Renouncing uh, something less for something greater. So, Knowledge, renunciation are foundational and to get a foothold in bhakti. But once bhakti is, is moving according to the principles that we are given and the mood to adopt these principles, then bhakti itself carries itself with the principles of knowledge and renunciation. In other words, they're already included. That's the process. And one of the biggest important factors of our spiritual advancement, and it's something that may be somewhat limited in our present situation, is sadhu sangha. Association with devotees, association with advanced devotees. Because the scriptures say that one of the most important principles of advancement in, the, in devotional service is the association with devotees especially advanced devotees. So if we're not able to do that, we have to associate as much as we can with, with the spiritual master's instructions and the spiritual master's books, Prabhupada's books. That is, a, that is a way of association too. But still we need physical association of other practitioners. That is required. It's difficult without that. And it's very much lessened by our particular situation we have now. But all this knowledge that you're asking in relationship to these question, this question comes by way of advancement in devotional service. Thank you very much. Uh, it, I just, uh, uh, it made me thought that uh, you, you spoke about uh, devotee association and uh, it's just from a practical point of view, it's, it's so interesting that uh, uh, our main, uh, uh, main process is uh, chanting the holy names together and, and actually uh, how it would be possible without uh, being humble because uh, uh, right. if we are not humble, how to be able to cooperate with others. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen persons who have come in and try to you know, keep their individuality um, free from the association of devotees. And after some time, they go away. Mm -hmm. They want to be in the, in the environment, but they don't want to associate. They're chanting, but they don't really want to develop relationships with others. They're serving, but they don't really want to develop relationships with others. They're worshiping same mood and after some time because they don't develop those relationships with others they go away Thank you very much. it's just part of the practice part of the feature where the support system comes by developing relationships with devotees mm -hmm. yeah it's just uh, it has such a big uh, science and and I fear that, uh, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, 
this age is uh, really, really doesn't support it with uh, all this impersonalism, uh, not, not really seeing uh, others as, as persons, but, uh, but like also sense subjects or something. So, so yes, and what, what can I get from this person? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, get, we gain to give. Giving is the goal, but we also accept things from others. So it's like a give and take thing. Mm -hmm. That's also mentioned in the uh, fourth verse of the Nectar of Instructions on the process of, uh, uh, you know, Guya, uh, guya Akyati, uh, developing relationships or loving exchanges. It's a, it's a give and take pro program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when I first read that verse, I was really, really uh, surprised because uh, for me, it was always easier to give, but obviously it's not possible to uh, develop relationships based on that. But mm -hmm. uh, yes, as I understand, I don't have, I shouldn't have expectations uh, by what I get, but, uh, but I should be able to, to accept when, when others want to give. So it's... Uh, it really changed my point of view. Yeah, we accept whatever people are giving. At the same time, we take it and we use it in order to give in another, in the same or another situation. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. How are we doing on time here? We're at, it's at, after the hour. Yes. Is there, any more, is there more questions? Oh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Uh, I've been listening to all the wonderful questions that my amazing God family is coming up with. Radha Bhakti, Radha Vinodini, Vivek Prabhu. And some thoughts are coming to me that when it comes to association, how important it is for us, for us to be extremely careful what kind of association we are getting into. Because there are some communities that are terribly dysfunctional, stagnant, ailing, with sick, traumatized people who are just not moving forward. And when we get into that situation, it can, act, it can actually play havoc with our own spiritual life. Yeah, it's correct. Mm -hmm. You want to associate with devotees. Mm -hmm. But if you're associating with peers, as it mentions, we develop friendship and serve together. If, you devote, if you're associating with seniors, then you look for opportunities to, to learn from them and to um, serve them. You're developing if you're in an, if you're out there giving Krishna consciousness to others, you're thinking I have something to give to these people, and these people are in need of of Prabhupada's mercy. So I am Prabhupada's representative. In other words, there is a principle of mercy attached to that type of interaction. We can't call it association, we call it interaction. So in different, you know, you just have to know. And it's easy to know You're the, the type of persons you are associating with. But if you're not sure, always be respectful. Doesn't mean you have to agree with everything. That's not, that's not, to agree with everybody all the time is not humility. <laughs> We can disagree, but we can we can respectfully disagree. If you you, you see the <clears throat> the interaction between Srila Prabhupada and Dr. Patel, 1973, mostly morning walk conversations with Dr. Patel. Dr. Patel was very familiar with Prabhupada. He got really from so much so that devotees would get really upset. <laughs> but Prabhupada, he liked Dr. Patel. And Dr. Patel really liked Prabhupada. So that was there. 
but they would argue. <laughs> they would argue. And Dr. Patel would, you know, challenge Sheila Prabhupada <laughs> and sometimes disagree with Prabhupada's answers. But that didn't mean that Dr. Patel had any less respect for Prabhupada. In fact, he even said that he's the most respectable person he has ever met. He had, he had, he had genuine affection for Srila Prabhupada. But they would argue, <laughs> they would disagree. The devotees couldn't understand it. But Prabhupada, he understood the heart of Dr. Patel, along with dealing with his, what we say, somewhat uncooperative nature. <laughs> but Dr. Patel was very intelligent. And he had a background, he had a history of being very, uh, what we say, successful in his occupation as a doctor. <laughs> so, you know. So yeah, this is a this was a kind of a like something that came about by situation. Dr. Patel just happened to come and join the morning walk. And when he realized the quality of Srila Prabhupada's intelligence, he became inspired to learn more. But in that inspiration, he would also argue. <laughs> but Prabhupada would stay with him and finally sometimes defeat him and then Dr. Patel would get it and he would say, oh yes, now I understand Swamiji. <laughs> but he had an eagerness to learn, but he also had an eagerness to teach at the same time. Okay, so I'll stop there and uh, thank you all. Uh, we would like to pursue this topic of humility tomorrow, but we are we have a lot of material to cover. So if there's any further discussion on the topic, it can be brought up in questions and answers as we go on in our day-to-day uh, -day talks. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much, Assembled Devotees, for your attention. Uh, all glory to Shila Prabhupada, all glory to Gurudev. Yes. Thank you very much. So, uh, if it wasn't so, yeah, it's, it's a little late, so um, well, I have to pass up the Japa session because I have a guest coming in soon. So uh, please, everyone, chant around together and end this, end it that way. Okay, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Shri Maharaj Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you.